Welcome to Dialogue Weekend. I'm Xu Qinduo. Today we have a special session with a focus on the high-level talks between China and the U.S. that have wrapped up in Anchorage, Alaska. After a tense opening between officials from both sides, the two got down to business. But with so many differences, uh, were, they, were there any positives to take away from the talks? And with a new president in the White House, how can the two sides deal with the many challenges the relationship faces? For a deeper look, I'm joined in the studio by Anna Tangen, Independent Current Affairs Commentator, via Zoom by Huang Jin, Dean of the Institute of International and Regional Studies at Beijing Languages and uh, Culture University, and Benoit Hadi Shatuang, Adjunct Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at Temple University, Japan. So welcome to the show, gentlemen. Uh, since the talks are down over there, uh, I would like to have your impression or your takeaway from uh, the discussion. I will start with you and from the, uh, the studio here. Well, it was, uh, d despite the claims by the U.S. that China was grandstanding, it was the opposite. Uh, you had uh, Blinken, Anthony Blinken, uh, come out with a very aggressive statement. Um, and, I, it, you know, this is not protocol. He deliberately violated protocol. This is a seasoned uh, diplomat. And he uh, antagonized uh, the Chinese side, which uh, responded. So that was the, the bad sour note that started, and, un and unfortunately, there's not a lot to bring away, uh, bring away from it. There were some talks about uh, relaxing visa restrictions, having people come in, uh, back and forth, students and scholars. But you know, in the midst of this kind of uh, hor horrifying attacks on Asians at random across the United States, I wonder how many uh, people, not only Chinese or Asian, will even want to go. Mm -hmm. Good point over there. Uh, Huang Jing, uh, what's your impression of the basically three uh, you know, uh, sessions of discussion, two days over there, you know, uh, despite the opening, the tense over there, but still they sit down and they talk about the business over there? Yeah, I think most uh, part of the dialogue this time are still not open to the public. So we still don't know exactly what they have uh, talked to each other in this uh, so-called uh, dialogue. Uh, so, but from what we know, especially the opening remarks, I think there are three points, there are three words or three points. Number one, uh, both sides, I think, understand each other better, not only on the diplomatic level, but on personal level. They have a little bit, you know, uh, back and forth uh, there. A second, I think both sides understand each other better. And uh, like the previous, uh, you know, uh, guest said, uh, that uh, Blinken opened up with a quite aggressive uh, but very clear message uh, it, to put the difference up on the table first. And of course, uh, Mr. Yang and Mr. Wang also, you know, uh, fight back uh, to tell them what Chinese want or what Chinese don't want. And third, uh, I think after all of this, uh, both sides still, you know, uh, accomplished the entire talk. And after that, as Minister Wang Yi said, uh, the, the, the tense, the situation is not really tense. At least both sides has uh, clearly expressed their stance and their opinion and their view. And in that part, I think it, it is, uh, uh, has achieved something there, uh, positive. Mm -hmm. Well, Benoit, uh, you know, with uh, the opening, you know, at least previously, you know, all the media focused on the opening. Uh, is that something really out of expectation for you? I would say so. I mean, this, from what we've seen in the media, the footage we have been able to, uh, to witness from the opening remarks, uh, I thought it was something truly extraordinary. I mean, I've been following diplom diplomacy, I've been following relations between China and the United States for a very long time. And the kind of tone that was employed by both sides is something that truly um, I don't recall ever uh, seeing. Um, it was the kind of, of the aggressivity of the remarks by uh, Secretary of State Blinken was quite uh, noticeable, as the previous guest uh, mentioned. But the tone as well that was employed by uh, Mr. Young on the Chinese side was uh, you could sense the annoyance, you could sense the, the rancor. Um, so we see a fairly high amount of, uh, of resentment on both sides at this point. And 
I would stand in a little bit different position than my pre than the previous guest. I would say that um, although it is never a bad thing to sit down and communicate, and of course at this juncture, the United States and China need to meet um, much more than they just did over the last few days. Uh, but I'm not sure really how positive the first uh, the first um, meeting was in terms of uh, the future of the relationship. Yes, they got to express their positions, but the reality is their positions were quite well known to each other already mm -hmm. maybe they were able to establish some personal relationship but that's not exactly clear either because according to the reports we have seen there have not been that much contact outside of the meetings no shared meals for example uh things that are usually on the agenda with these sorts of meetings um so just to conclude my remarks i would say that yeah i'm, I'm somewhat uh, i'm quite surprised by the tone of the meeting and not so sure about how positive uh, they were or how how helpful these meetings were mm -hmm. well and uh, if you you know before the meeting the u.s had talked about uh, this is not like uh, you know the beginning of a series of dialogues this could be a one-off uh do you think there will be follow-up meetings you know with all you know all that uh, uh, talks over there they did talk about uh, forming a committee uh to work on the climate change uh, if that's the thing they need to talk to each other, at least on some level. Well, there's no question. I mean, to, to deal with any of the inter pressing international situations, whether it's the health response to COVID, the economic response to nuclearization, climate change, the list goes on. They have to talk to each other. But remember, this was a show. This was really about Biden trying to uh, do a couple of things. One, domestically. He wanted to find an issue that he could unite Americans on. Uh, he's having problems domestically uh, with his agenda, even with his own party, now, let alone the Republicans. He's well aware that Republicans want to use the China issue as an election issue in the, uh, you know, the uh, midterms and also the next presidential election. He's trying to take that away from him. So this was more aimed at uh, domestic uh, side of things. Uh, you know, remember, it, it, listing 24 Hong Kong of, uh, officials mm -hmm. uh, on the blacklist, delisting three uh, Chinese telecoms. These were all done within days of this particular right meeting. before the right talks before. started. So you know, this this was uh, you know Blinken trying to push China's buttons, uh, doing everything they possibly could to make sure that this was on a sour note, so that they could kind of grandstand and say to the American public, look. You know, we're standing up to China. But, you know, there's a real question here about what Biden is selling. What's the strategic vision? You know, with Trump, it was kind of post-truth, this idea that you could just make things up. But with Biden, it seems to be post-conspiracy. I mean, hypocrisy. Because he, he talks about all of these issues, like, for instance, he was, he's been very tough on the South China Sea claims mm -hmm. that China has. Mm -hmm. But... They just sold a huge amount, of, you know, they just agreed to sell very, very, uh, what they call red zone, uh, uh, you know, uh, military gear to Taiwan, which Taiwan. has exactly the same <laughs> claims to the South China Seas. The same thing with Australia. They said that uh, they don't like the pressure that China's economic pressure that China's put on Australia. That's kind of rich coming from a country that has imposed unilateral sanctions, which are most likely illegal on China, and now even Biden is refusing to remove them. So you're, you're seeing this, I mean, even, even with like this drug thing, I mean, you know, they just fired a bunch of people from the White House for using marijuana. This is kind of odd, given the fact that he's stood up and talked about his son's uh, hunters, mm -hmm. uh, you know, using struggles drugs, yeah. with drugs yeah. and saying that he should not be judged on that. So there seems to be a, a merging this idea that he wants to sell this kind of revisionist, uh, nostalgic view that America is back and you should trust them. Does the world trust a leader like the U.S., uh, given what's been happening there? I mean, domestically, uh, Texas, the capital, the COVID response, the forever wars in uh, the Middle East, Afghanistan. These things are not the kind of things where you say, look, we've done a great job, follow us. Mm -hmm. Well, good point over there. Uh, Benoit, uh, if you look at the Biden administration, you know, before, uh, you know, after he was elected, there was a lot of hope that, uh, you know, Biden would reverse 
uh, many of the policies uh, uh, imposed by the Trump administration because you know, people say that's, that's just uh, uh, counterproductive uh, in many, many aspects. But uh, when he took office, uh, in particular the China policy, instead of reversing uh, those policies like uh, you know, taking, getting rid of the tariffs, they are strengthening all those uh, you know, hardline policies against China. For example, more warships crossing the Taiwan Strait and more uh, so-called navigation of, of freedom of navigation in the South China Sea operation over there. Uh, so is the Biden administration actually uh, even more hardline, hardlining uh, in terms of China policy? Um, the great question you're asking. I don't see so far necessarily a hardening the position. I see more of a continuation of the American position on, uh, on China. You um, mentioned uh, the, the changes or the lack of change when it comes to China. It is true that on other issues, there have been already uh, some changes in the Biden administration. They have already taken steps to reverse some of the, uh, some of the policies that had been taken by the Trump administration. But indeed, when it comes to uh, China and one of the previous guests really astutely pointed this out. Uh, a lot of it is, or uh, yeah, a large part of it, I would say, is related to the domestic audience in the United States and also sending the message to the Republicans that they will be equally as uh, as as uh, confrontational or tough on China. Uh, there, there's always been this perception um, among Republicans that's been a real point of attack. As a matter of fact, that uh, Biden would be too accommodating towards Beijing. So so far, we are seeing that he wants uh, the Biden administration wants to make sure that this is this will not be the perception. Now, is this more of a hardline uh, position than than Trump? As I mentioned, so far I don't see it as such. I see it as a continuation. There's nothing that indicates that they're going to be necessarily more confrontational. Let's not forget the kind of rhetoric that was employed by the Trump administration, especially over the last year or two. Um, what I think we're going to see from Biden is something is more of a um, overall a measured tone. Yes, you might say that what we saw and encourage what we was not necessarily much of a measured tone on the part of the American administration, but that's kind of the opening act, if you will. I believe that we're going to see something that's going to be more um, workable and slightly perhaps easier to, uh, it's maybe slightly easier to manage uh, the, the, the rivalry, the competition between the two sides. But again, only the next few months or years will be able to truly answer that question. Uh, so, Huang Jin, uh, in a press conference, you know, after the talks, senior Chinese diplomat Yang Jiechi said the China-U.S. talks were candid constructive and helpful. Uh, so this is a very general assessment of the uh, just ended the discussion with the US side. Uh, what do you make of that? Do you agree with him? I, I think, of course, uh, to talk is much better than not to talk to each other. That's why I mean the positive and uh, at least both sides has exchanged uh, certain opinions face to face, despite the fundamental differences between the two sides. I think when uh, Mr. Yang said it's constructive and helpful, I think that's what he meant. That is, uh, both sides at least have the, you know, uh, this kind of a high level uh, dialogue. They call it a strategic or not. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what happened. Because I think that I agree with the previous uh, guest said that, uh, you know, President Biden is uh, dealing with uh, a, a very serious dilemma here. On the one hand, he understands it is necessary to work with China on some major issues we are facing today to meet some you know, fundamental challenges or formidable challenges like uh, climate change, you know, non-proliferation and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> you cannot solve this problem, not even manage those problems without the you know, United States and China working uh, with each other rather than you know, fighting against each other. But on the other hand, Mr. Biden is uh, you know, facing a very strong, sometimes too strong, you know, uh, uh, opposition at home. They're watching everything he did, especially on China. They use China issue as an election issue. So uh, they already called him the Beijing Biden. Uh, you know, the only expression that he said, we will work with China or cooperate with China if we have to, even that law has been attacked very seriously as, you know, called uh, to Beijing. So as a result, he he will have to do this kind of thing. That on the one hand, he has facing the you know a home audience to make sure that 
he would not be attacked, at least not be attacked that seriously on the issue of China. But on the other hand, he will have to find, find a way to work with China, to, to talk to the Chinese, uh, you know, to really, uh, you know, uh, the, the make the world feel like the United States is back, America's leadership is back. But can you imagine if a country, a number one power we're talking about, keep fighting against everyone? That is not a leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, if the United States really want to win back Japan, Europe, and other allies, they have to consider other uh, countries' interests vis-a-vis -vis China, which is not always uh, such a hotline approach. So as a result, I think this kind of dialogue will talk tell us, not only Americans, but of course the Chinese side, the, the major audience is still at home. This is maybe part of the so-called characteristics of major power relations. That is, you have to make sure your leaders will survive at home before you can do any uh, so-called diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you know, from what you have said, actually there are two issues here, I think, you know. Blinken, uh, Secretary of State, uh, you know, after the talks, uh, he said the Chinese side and the U.S. side did talk about the regional issues like Afghanistan issues, nuclear issues in the Korean Peninsula, Iranian issue, climate change. Okay, these are the areas the two sides can cooperate because they have common interests. But the thing is, like, uh, you know, with the U.S. trying its best to contain China, uh, trying to unite with other countries, its allies against China. Why should China cooperate with the U.S.? I think because China also has some, for China's own interests, not for the interests of the United States, for China's own interests, China also needs to work with the United States on some issues that we have to work together uh, to manage uh, or, or, or solve the issues like climate change, like non-proliferation, and like terrorism and so on and so forth. I think both Chinese leaders and China, you know, American leaders understand this. This is something they have to do it together. They cannot, you know, solve these issues. I think when China, of course, China knows the United States is trying everything possible to contain China or to hold China back. But that does not mean China will do everything against the United States. I think that's childish. That's not mature. I think for, for big power like China, and China would behave like a big power. That is, even though we do have conflict interests, even though we do have huge fundamental differences on issues like human rights or values and so forth, but as a responsible citizen of a global village, uh, you know, we have to work each, with each other to solve the issues that, you know, is endangering the entire village, entire world. Mm -hmm. I think that is mature uh, approach. That is why I think uh, you know, Secretary Blinken's uh, behavior is a little bit appalling because when he calls, uh, you know, the journalist back to room to listen to his second talk, obviously he wants this journalist, journalist to show that he's tough on China. Of course, his audience is not the world, not the Chinese. His audience is American. So that is a little bit, you know, uh, small action, I think, that uh, really and make, make the Chinese side angry because we are here to talk with each other to solve some major issues. But what you are doing is try to show to Americans you are standing up against China, which is a little bit, you know, not very diplomatic. That's a mild, mild uh, comment. Mm -hmm. Well, Anna, you know, another uh, phrase quite uh, frequently used by the U.S. side is, you know, position of strength. What does exactly mean? You know, they say, you know, we want to start the talks with the Chinese side from a position of strength? Well, um, I mean, generally just means that I have more power than you do. I have, you know, <laughs> it's not a but, positioning. But, but, but isn't China, case, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, understanding from that angle, isn't China in a position of strength? China contains the virus, its economy almost fully recovered. The rich deal, RCEP, you know, investment agreement with, uh, with the European Union. Yes. Well, I mean, th th those, it's perceptive strength. Uh, you know, as, as you know, Donald Trump wanted to bully China, uh, unilateral actions, not only against uh, China, but also against allies, uh, kind of a go it alone playground bully strategy. Um, Biden says, well, that didn't work. I still agree. America first, uh, you know, American hegemony has to be a uh, primary uh, focus of the U.S. Uh, but his idea is the position of strength is he gets allies 
uh, or other countries to go along with him on this. That's why he did the, you know, the Quad Tour, and then he stopped in Japan and South Korea, all the way along, collecting grievances that were going to be aired at this uh, particular meeting. So when, they, when the U.S. invited China to Anchorage, which is unusual because a meeting of this type would have taken place in a neutral third country. Uh, China went uh, over, you know, they, they said, okay, we're willing to do this. And then to be uh, basically um, disrespected and not, you know, not, not even attempting to use diplomatic uh, language. But I, I do uh, agree with my uh, um, colleague. I think the Chinese response at the end was constructive. Basically, they went back to diplomatic norms. They said, look, you know, frank discussion, we're going forward. Um, unfortunately, you really didn't see that on the, on the U.S. side, which it leads to me back to this idea that this was just a grandstand play for the domestic audience. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Benoit, you speak of the tour of the U.S. officials uh, right before the, you know, the, the talks between the two sides. Uh, uh, one stop is uh, in Japan and, uh, of course, uh, following uh, after uh, then they went to South Korea. And in Japan, uh, the both sides reached this uh, joint statement. Uh, you know, how big is that to Japan? We also remember, of course, Japan's largest trading partner is China. And if you compare their statement with that one produced in South Korea, South Korea has made it very clear they will not be forced to choose sides between China and the United States. But Japan is in a different situation. Yes, Japan is indeed in a very different uh, situation. I was struck uh, indeed by the tone of the joint declaration between the U.S. side and the Japanese side. Um, although over the last few years we have seen some um, some pointed criticisms on the part of Japan uh, towards uh, some issues that they have with China, including in the East China Sea. Um, generally speaking, um, if you include uh, all partners in Asia, if you include the U.S. and all its allies, Japan has ten to be uh, more cautious regarding uh, the statements that it made uh, towards China. And there's a very good reason for that. Uh, you mentioned that the Chinese, uh, China is the number one trade partner for Japan. It would be not in Japan's interest to antagonize China, which is why generally, although it has not necessarily refrain from criticizing China, it has taken uh, a, a somewhat more measured tone, I would say. So therefore, the fact that the joint declaration um, was or made a direct reference to China, I think is uh, significant. I, this is, I think this is something that the United States were looking for. They wanted to show more of a, um, um, they wanted to show the unity in front of China. And I think in that sense, they were able to reach their goal. But I wonder what that is going to result in in terms of the near future of Japan-China relations. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Huang Jing, you know, looking forward, uh, you know, China has been saying that you know, they are talking about uh, a peaceful development, you know, uh, conducting uh, with, I mean, it's a relationship with a focus on trade and investment. And now you have this uh, vaccines making, you know, being made, public goods, as promised by the Chinese leaders over there. Um, but the, the U.S. is really focusing on building up the allies against China. What should China do to respond to that? I think China's response is to continue to, first and foremost, do its own sense well, because if China can have a solidarity at home and keep Chinese economy going, I think China really cannot be defeated or even contained, like Mr. Yang said. Uh, meanwhile, China should still continue its policy of open up and reform. Uh, you know, like uh, Xi Jinping said, only when the world is doing well, China can do well, because as a number one trading partner, China want a stable, peaceful, and prosperous world outside China, uh, which is for China's own good. So if China really want to, you know, to improve or stabilize the bilateral relationship with the United States. I think China should focus not just on the United States, but focus on a much bigger world, including Europe, Japan, and so on and so forth, uh, to be a responsible big power and to really deliver some public goods like vaccine, because, you know, again, uh, if the world is good, uh, China should be good. On that regard, I do not believe that the United States and China, this bilateral relationship between the two, will continue like a free fall because both countries, both leaders do have this desire uh, to stabilize at least this so-called strategic competition because it serves 
interests of both countries. I can say, I can not believe Mr. Biden want to continue to make the bilateral relationship has us afraid for because that does not work. Uh, that does not work for interests of neither United States nor China. So the two leaders, let, let's let me remind uh, all of us, the two leaders has a long telephone conversations just, you know, uh, just not long ago, over two hours and 50 minutes. Uh, obviously, they have something to talk to each other. That's why this kind of the tone of this dialogue in uh, in Arkansas, in Alaska is really kind of appalling because obviously both sides, especially the United States, like we said, is trying to make up a show uh, for the dom uh, domestic audience, which, in my view, is not really constructive or or, or positive. But after all, I I, I do not see why the two. Uh, major powers will continue to fight against each other. Of course, competition will go on, will be normal for a long, long time. But to make it manageable, to make it stabilized, works for everybody's interest. In that regard, I still have some hope, a lot of hope actually, uh, down the road, that China and the United States should be able to manage not only the bilateral relationship at a controllable, manageable level, but should also be uh, you know, delivering some public goods to the entire world. After all, they are two largest countries. If the two largest countries, you know, behave like like a kid and not do very constructive like Donald Trump has done, then we are all in big trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Anna, obviously, this is a kind of like a missing part in the dialogue between the two sides. You know, the. Uh, billions and uh, hundreds of billions of interests uh, of the business community from the US, uh, from China, and also the financial markets. China is opening a lot of investment from, uh, from the United States. Uh, so, you know, that uh, used to be playing a stabilizing factor of this bilateral relationship. Even today, somehow we are not discussing, not mentioning that often about that, but they are there, right? Absolutely. I mean, last week, an industry association of technology companies from the U.S. Uh, got together and said they're going to work directly with their Chinese counterparts, uh, in essence, to try to create a unified position that they can take to the U.S. government and say, listen, uh, if you do not change things, we are going to lose business. We lose business. We lose the ability to invest in R&D. If we do that, we are going to be further behind the game. So it is in the best interest. And I would agree with my colleague. These are the two major benefactors of world order. If they do not cooperate and continue and create a, a more world order, they will be the two biggest losers from a world of chaos. But, but, but of course, you know, uh, there is a challenge, you know, as we mentioned actually in our discussion uh, several times, the domestic audience. Somehow U.S.-China policy is being kind of like kidnapped by the domestic uh, you know, voice, you know, to be tough with China. Yeah, don't, don't ever be surprised when a politician acts like a politician, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so uh, in this particular area, the thing that bothers me most is this kind of uh, schism that is opening up between power and money. You have on one, on one hand all this horrible, you know, this rhetoric, uh, very negative uh, towards China. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the economics are swinging definitely towards the east. You start looking not only at investment, uh, bonds, uh, markets, everything is going that direction. And generally when you have these kind of schisms, these deep divides, it points to trouble. There has to be some sort of equilibrium that is reached so that you can have it. You cannot run a government on promises. It has to be run on business and revenues. And if you take away those revenues, you're undercutting your own government. Hopefully. Uh, that we will sort out the differences over there. Well, with that, we are coming to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also watch us on the CGT app or on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. You can find me on Twitter, Xu Qinduo, one word. Thanks for watching. See you next week.